Well, let's take our Bibles, please, at this time and turn to the Gospel of Luke in the 8th chapter, Luke chapter 8. I started a series last time on storms, and we had a couple more this week. They were doozies, weren't they? And I got to thinking, as long as they're going to keep storming, I'm just going to keep preaching on storms here. But seriously, this is a two-parter, and I just wanted to get started off on the new year on the right foot. Now, last time, we were talking about riding out the storms of life, riding out the storms of life. And I want to continue with that train of thought, but I want to look at a different passage here in the Gospel of Luke in the 8th chapter. We're going to pick it up in uh, verse number 22. It says, Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Now, the story continues, and we won't take the time to read it, but he gets to the other side, to a region known today as Decapolis. It really was even then. It was a region with ten Roman cities in them, and one of them was Gadara. And there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he meets this demon-possessed man, wore no clothes, came out, and he's just raging there. And and Christ commands that the demons go into the pigs. The pigs, demon-possessed, go over the cliff. Those attending the pigs, they run back into town. They say what's happened. The townspeople come out, and they ask Jesus to leave, leaving only that former demoniac of Gadara there, clothed now and in his right mind, and asking, can I come with you? Can I follow you? And Christ says, no, you just go back to your village, and you tell them how great a thing God hath done for you. And this thing ended here with this one, one soul now on the road to heaven. And, and, you know, you say, well, they lost all those pigs. But it goes to show us that God really holds one person in great value. In fact, Christ says, your soul is worth more than the whole world. But that's really not the sermon. The, the sermon here is the fact that the disciples on the way over across the, Red, or the, uh, the uh, Sea of Galilee here, they encounter this storm, and Christ is sleeping, and they're freaking out. And they awaken him, and he calms the storm, and then he rebukes them, or at least chides them, by saying, where's your faith? Where's your faith? Their faith wasn't there as they were riding out the storm. Now, we want to have faith, beloved, that takes us through the storms. And so we'll be talking again about riding out the storms of life. But let's pray before we begin. Father, we thank you now for this opportunity to be back in your house today. And we pray that you'd bless our time in your word. We pray that it would be helpful. And Lord, that you would use it to encourage us, yea, to undergird us and strengthen us and enable us to come through the storms of life, yea, perhaps even those that lie before us in this coming year. We pray now for you to help us to listen and to learn and to remember that which we hear today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There was an elderly lady years ago who owned a parakeet. She loved that parakeet to death. Uh, The name of the parakeet was Chippy. And Chippy sat in this nice parakeet cage there, all, uh, you know, safe and secure and and eating seeds and, and just having, living the dream, basically, until one day something happened to Chippy and Chippy was never the same. That woman was vacuuming out, you know how you ladies do that, you take the hose with the end and vacuum something out when you want to get specific. And so this lady had the end of the hose there and she's vacuuming out the cage of the parakeet when all of a sudden the phone rang and she turned around to, to grab it and all of a sudden she heard this awful sound. They were like, like a floop and, and she knew instantly, oh no. And she looked and she turned around and Chippy was gone. He got sucked up in the hose. And she's thinking the worst so she turns off the vacuum cleaner, she unzips the bag and there's old Chippy, he's all gray and dusty and wiping his eyes and so on. And, and she goes, oh, you poor thing. And so she grabs him and runs him into the, the bathtub and turns on the cold water. And out comes this ice cold water and, and just blasts away all this dust on Chippy. And, and afterwards, Chippy is shivering. And, and she goes, oh, you poor thing. So she goes and she gets his hair dryer and she puts it on extra hot and extra fast. And she blows Chippy all off and dries him off and, and puts him back in the cage. And he'd been sucked in and, and washed down 
down and, and, and heated up and, and he lost his song. He didn't sing much anymore. And, and you say, well, you know what? There's times when we feel that way. Like we've been sucked in and, and, and drowned and, and heated up and, and blown away and we lose our song. You know, Jesus Christ is on the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is home to a place called Decapolis. I was there a few years ago, and, and actually the ruins of Decapolis are, are still there. It, it was known as Gadara, uh, and it was where this demon-possessed guy had been living amongst the tombs for some time. And there on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, he's awaiting a visit from Jesus Christ, and he didn't even really know it. Christ gets in this boat with his disciples. And of course, his disciples, at least some of them, were fishermen. And so this was not foreign to them. They had been on these waters many times. They had made their living on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is really not a sea. It's actually more like a lake. It's, it's eight miles wide, and it's 13 miles high up and down. That's not a sea. I actually grew up on a lake in Polk County that was eight miles wide. It was much narrower, but we know those to be lakes. And so here's this place called the Sea of Galilee, which is also known as the Lake of Gennesaret. And though it was not very big, it was very deep. In fact, it was about 140 feet deep. The lake I grew up on was about 15 feet deep. So get the contrast here, 140 feet deep, but about the size of a bigger lake in say Minnesota next door here. But the Sea of Galilee is in a very low spot on the earth. Actually, it is 700 feet below sea level. You, you figure that out. But it's, it's very low, and it has these mountains surrounding it. And from those mountains would come these storms without notice, out of nowhere, over the tops of these mountains. And the Sea of Galilee was famous for its storms. And last time we looked at at Paul, he's out on the Mediterranean Sea, but this time it's Peter, and, and it's the others, it's the disciples, and there are some lessons to learn about this storm that they encounter. Now, we see, first of all, what I call the sovereign intention. God had an intention in, in allowing this storm and bringing this storm around, and God's intentions are always bigger than our storms. Never forget that. You're going through storms, some of you right now, but God has something in that storm, an intention, and, and he sees a bigger picture. You see the tip of the iceberg, but God has a picture or a, a purpose in the storms of life. And in verse 22 of our text, it says, Now it came to pass on a certain day that he, Christ, went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake, and they launched forth. Now, to them, they had no idea where they were going. Jesus did. Jesus knew exactly where they were going. And he was way ahead of his disciples. The apostles were just along for the ride. Those of you who've raised kids, you know that when they hop in the car, they don't really care where you're going. Now, you know where you're going, and you have plans. But they're just along for the ride. They're wherever mom and dad go. And so here's the disciples and they're just following Jesus. He says, let's get in this boat. Let's go to the other side. But Christ wasn't just killing time. He wasn't just going, oh, let's go for a boat ride here. No, he had a plan, didn't he? And we know what that plan is now, but the disciples didn't then. But the point is, God always has a plan. And we forget that. God's never sitting around twiddling his thumbs. He's always up to something. And Jesus knew there was a demon-possessed man on the other side but he also knew that between them and that man was going to be a storm. Those winds were going to come off those mountains down into the Sea of Galilee. And, and, and so they're going to have to go through a storm to get over there. But Christ had a destiny. He had a destiny for those men. He had a destiny for that demoniac. By the way, he has a destiny for you. You know, you're just not wandering aimlessly through life going, I'm just taking up space and air and whatever. No, Jesus has a destiny for your life and mine. But there are often storms along the way. We need to understand that. Between us and the outcome, we find here there's going to be this storm. But it doesn't negate the fact that God has something planned. God has intentions that are bigger than ours. And God never fails to do what he wants to do, when he wants to do, where he wants to do it, with whom he wants to do it. God never fails with his intentions. Now, we do. And we can make plans, but they can be thwarted and, and we can mean well we can try our best we can be committed we can we can try and follow through but but sometimes we have these plans and they don't materialize 
And, and so it doesn't really pan out with our family. You know, kids say, well, you said, I know, but it didn't work out. And so we can have intentions, but, but we don't have the wherewithal to follow through on them. And as a result, they just fall flat. But with God, if he plans it, it's going to happen. We know it's going to happen. We read in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. We can be confident of this one thing. If God has a plan, he will perform it. It will happen. And so Jesus had intentions that day. And as they got in the boat, he knew exactly where they were heading, but he also knew there was this impending storm, this storm. The disciples didn't see it coming, but God had a purpose in it. Sometimes we don't see what's coming. It blindsides us. In fact, after the message last Sunday morning, I, I uh, met up with a gal who's been in the church for decades, and she said, my mother passed away the day before yesterday. I didn't even know that. You know that we have, I, I believe now in the church, uh, this past week, three or four, I think it's four, of uh, folks whose mothers have died, and another church member who's passed. And, and we don't see that stuff coming. We've had funerals this last week, but people die, and, and we don't see that happening so often. Sometimes it's job related. You don't see that coming. Maybe you're betrayed by somebody you trusted and you didn't see that coming. Or maybe you're just confused about what's going on right now. I got an email from somebody in a, a distant state this last week and they said, please pray that we would get some direction from God. You know, there are folks and, and they don't know which way to turn. Sometimes it's a feeling of hopelessness. Sometimes the devil comes along, he whispers in your ear. As we sung a moment ago, there's no need to try. You just might as well give up and, and you're overwhelmed with despair. So what do you do next? Well, what you do is you stop and you realize that God's aware of all this. And he has a sovereign intention. Sovereign means he does what he knows is best. Intention means what he has planned. And God has a plan greater than ours. And he has an intention quite often that's bigger than our storm. Do you believe that? His intention is bigger than our storm. We see the sovereign intention, but secondly, we see the strange interpretation. Now, in verse number 23, it says, But as they sailed, he, Jesus, fell asleep, and there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. Now, this is strange. In the midst of these men going through this storm, the Son of God falls asleep. We see here the humanity of Christ, don't we? Oh, he was God, but he was also man. And he, he falls asleep in the middle of a storm. How do you do that? I mentioned a few weeks ago, falling asleep in the middle of a Bible study. How do you do that? But we find here, Jesus put in some long hours, and he did. I mean, we'd see him praying through the night. And now he's tired. And he'd have to be tired to fall asleep in a storm. And here's the apostle, just the opposite. We're going to die, we're going to die. And they're just panicking, and they're just bouncing off the sides of the boat. This was a big deal to them. But not with Christ. Not with Christ. You know, the last thing on their mind was sleeping. I mean, how do you sleep when a problem is consuming you? You ever had nights where you're consumed with a problem? In the past 35 years, I don't know the hours I've spent pacing during the night through my house or uh, in a motel room, or in the sanctuary here. I, I mean, you, you, you get up and you cannot sleep and you just pace. Why do we have to stay awake and help God run the world? You know, that's the bottom line, but we do. Now, it's okay to stay up and, and to pray. Don't get me wrong. That, that's fine. There's a time for that. But why do we lie awake and worry? And we do. You know, the Bible has something to say about that. Psalm 127 says, It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. God wants us to go to bed. Quit worrying about it. So to the disciples here, this is terrible. They're in a storm here. They're helpless. And they couldn't change the situation at all. And they couldn't. Folks, you can't change the weather. All right? We've said that so often. There's nothing you can do about the weather. We've been seeing that as of late here. And, and there's a helpless feeling when it comes to some things in life that we just can't change. I mean, there are circumstances 
we often wish we could correct or change or alter in some way, but we can't. Jesus said in Matthew 6, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit, it's about this much, unto a statue? So somebody says, boy, I'd like to be this much taller. Oh, I'm going to think it. I'm going to think it. Christ says you can't. It just doesn't work that way. Now, there's humanism that says if you think it and claim it, you can have it and, and you can change it. No, there are some things in life you just can't change. You know, I could have never been in the NFL. I, I've got good hands, I got the moves, but I never had the speed, as it were. And I could wish all I want, yeah, I'm going to play in, in the bigs. Uh, you can't. In, in, in most cases, I was talking to a fella, I mean, he was a standout at NDSU years ago, and I mean, he had everything to make it in, in the NFL except the size. And he knew it. He could play at the level he was at, but he really couldn't go any, any further than that. And reality is that there are some things you just can't change them. Basically, your IQ, your, your, your looks, your musical ability, your general athleticism, there are things you just can't change, including the weather. You just can't really do anything about the weather. That's God's business. And, and if you don't like it, if you don't agree with it, with it, it, it won't matter really. Whatever that is that you cannot change won't matter in heaven. I mean, it, all it will take is a few years in eternity and you'll look back at that little blink of the eye you called a life and go, boy, I got worked up about some things back yonder. And, and you really won't have to worry about it. But for now, you struggle to understand. And you say, well, why is God doing this? Or at the least, why is God allowing this? Why doesn't he change this? I don't know. But I do know Isaiah 55, God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God does some things, God allows some things that they really seem strange to us at times, don't they? And we wouldn't do it that way, but we're not God. God sees a bigger picture. And oftentimes those storms he allows into our lives are for a, a testing. And if we pass the test, it's advancement time. We go to the next grade. If we pass the test, it brings us closer to him. You know, also God will use scary and dark times in our lives as an opportunity to remind us that we are really not in control. The power is not ours, the power is his. And it's about his glory, it's not about ours. And those trials will draw us closer to him. And so we see this strange interpretation. It's a heavenly one. It's not an earthly one. And, <clears throat> you know, there are a number of people, and I know folks, they've given up on God over this very thing. He, it's like God doesn't care, because if he did, he would fix this. But no, there's a bigger picture than we see. There's a lot bigger picture than we see. And, and God might be up to something, we have no idea what he's up to. Many people have come to Christ through trials. Many people have come to, to know Christ as their Lord and Savior because they have been broken of their pride through a trial. And, and, and so it causes them to turn to God. Their back is to the wall. They're stripped of their idols. And, and God does something to get their attention, quite often through a storm. For a Christian, let me just say, it's been said that, that storms are opportunities in work clothes. That's a good way of putting it. They really are. Storms are opportunities in work clothes. They're practical, and it's really a time when we see the promises of God tested in our lives and that they're true. Because faith, faith is trusting God in spite of circumstances. Uh, really, believing or claiming God's promises at dark times. Here's the disciples and they've been walking around with the Son of God for years, but they're still biting their nails here in, in the midst of this storm. They don't realize God is up to something bigger than they, than they see there. It's a strange interpretation to them, which brings on the third thought, the secret inclination. In verse 23 again, it says, But as they sailed, he, Christ, fell asleep, and there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water, and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. Now, the Bible tells us here that the boat was filled 
with water. You know what happens when a boat fills with water? It's just a matter of time until it sinks. So this, this is a big deal. They've lost control of the boat. Now, I've spent a lot of time in boats. I, I grew up in boats from the time I was a, a toddler. I spent hundreds of hours, of hours in a boat and, and some stormy rides. And I know this, <coughs> a, a, any vessel can be hard to control in the midst of a storm. And in fact, last week we talked about Paul out there bobbing around on the Mediterranean like a cork in the sea. And the Bible says, and running under a certain island, which is called Clada, Luke says we had much work to come by the boat. That's nautical talk of saying we couldn't control the boat. We had much work to just control it. Now, storms in life make it hard to navigate, don't they? Hard to get through. We've lost control of the situation. And, and, and we're, we're, we're not able to control the boat of life, as it were. We find here in verse 23 that they were in jeopardy. Notice at the end of the verse. They were in jeopardy. And, and we look at that word and we go, ho hum. You know, we think it's a game show. But jeopardy in the Greek here means very desperate times. Life or death times here. And in other words, severe danger. They, they feared losing their life because there was nothing but water between them and 140 feet under them to the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. You, you don't stand on your tippy toes if you fall out of that boat and keep your head above water. That's deep water. 140 feet of water below them. And, and so what did they do? What would you do? Well, they did the right thing. I mean, if you had Jesus in the boat and there was a storm, duh, <laughs> right? You got the Son of God here. He created the universe. I think you can handle this. You'd wake him up, wouldn't you? And, and so they did the right thing. I mean, they had the Son of God in the boat with them. Doesn't get any more convenient than that. But wait a minute. We have the Son of God in us, don't we? Uh, the Bible calls him the Spirit of Christ. And, and the Holy Spirit lives inside of a born-again Christian. And so we have the same access to the same Son of God here. So they wake up Jesus. Does he get up kind of uh, rubbing his eyes and groggy and, you know, what's going on here? No. He gets up fully aware of what's going on. And, and he heard him talking even when he was sleeping. And by the way, he still hears us. And he is inclined to hear us. Whatever storm we're going through, his inclination is to hear us. That's his nature, to hear what we're going through. He's, he's never in a deep sleep, as it were. In fact, I love this verse in Jeremiah 33. God says, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. There's a great story behind this verse. I don't have time to tell it. But God wants us to call on him. He wants us to call on him. You know that there have been special studies done that, that show that a mother has a particular ear for her child. And, and you can have a room full of babies and if one starts squawking, the mother of that child will recognize their child. They know their child instantly. I've seen it around the church here. I've been out there in the hallway of the East Wing and there's a group of mothers talking, a group of kids down the hall, and one bangs his, his little shin or something and starts squalling and, and all of a sudden that mother gets up and starts running and I'm going, you know, they just sound like a bunch of kids to me. And dads are that way. That just sounds like a bunch of kids. Not mom. She has a special ear to hear that. Well, let me just say this. God has a special ear for his kids. His kids. You say, well, are all his kids... No, 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 that's, that's bad theology. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. We're not all God's children. In fact, the Bible refers to children of the world and even children of the devil. But when you get saved, you become a child of God. And the Bible says, but as many as received him, Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you have to become something, you weren't that before, Right? And so when you get saved, you become a child of God. And with that, the special blessing of being able to call unto him and he'll answer you and show you great and mighty things like you could never imagine. That's unique to a born-again Christian. When you've been born again into the family of God, God hears the cry of one of his children. I love this passage. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh or near unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite or humble or broken spirit. 
So if you can relate to that verse, cry out to God. Cry out to God today. He's waiting for you. Here's Christ. He's in that boat. He's quiet. He's motionless. But he's still in tune with what was going on. Jesus was no less God when he was asleep as he was when he was preaching to a crowd of thousands. He was no less God when he was lying down as he was when he was standing up. The Lord never checks out. Just know that. He didn't then, he doesn't now. Our God might be silent. You say, well, I, I don't see him, I don't hear him. That's by design. It all requires faith. That's all part of his plan. But he is always, always very much aware of your issues and what you're going through. His inclination is to help us. We read this in Psalm 34. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Which brings me to my fourth thought. We see the sovereign intention, the strange interpretation, the secret inclination. Fourthly, this strong intervention. God's intervention is bigger than our storms. Notice verse number 25. It says, And he that is Christ said unto them, Where is your faith? And they being afraid wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. What manner of man is this? Did they really need to ask that question? I mean, they'd been walking with him for some time. They'd seen him do a bunch of miracles. But they're still amazed because this is unreal. You don't control the weather. I said that a moment ago. It's one thing you cannot control. It's not humanly possible. And that's it exactly. It's not humanly possible, right? It's only divinely possible. Only God can control some things. We need to remember that. So if God can control the wind and the waves and the rain, do, do you think maybe he could control your predicaments? I mean, if God can alter the, the laws of nature, can he help me with my problem? Can he help you with your problem? I think so. I, I don't think there's any storm too big for God. I, I, I believe that. I hope you believe that. And, and even the wind and the waves obey his will. We sing that song. All nature recognizes his authority. All circumstances are under his control. And I mean all, all. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. I don't know how. You don't know how. I don't understand that, but he does. And if God can use the bad stuff of life to bring about good, then God can do that in your life and mine. He'll do that for, for his glory and for our good. I believe that. And, and I thank God that his intervention is bigger than our storms. Well, after that strong intervention, we see finally the sure instruction. Now, what can we learn from this? Well, it's simple. Whatever God's up to, it's bigger than what we're going through. <laughs> There's more to it than we see. Uh, we just see part of it. His, his instruction, his teaching is bigger than our storm. And God is more interested in making the man, or God is more interested in making the woman than he is in progress even as we look at it. You know, common sense says, no storm between us and that demoniac. We could make better time. We could make better progress. We could be more efficient. We could get more done. God is more interested in making the man than he is our Dumb little progress, as it were. I'm a progress guy, okay? I'm always, you know, what's most effective? What's most efficient? How can we get the most done? That's where it's at. That's what matters. No, God is more interested in making me. So there are times he will say, uh, 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 let, let's just stop here. There's something bigger than your progress here. You know, we read this in Psalm 32. God says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. You know, here's the apostles being instructed, and they're going through some stuff. Really, nothing else could have taught them except this storm. They had to go through this storm in order to grow in faith, for example. In, in verse 25, Christ says, where's your faith? That's a good question. I mean, they probably thought they had a lot of faith. In fact, they were all bragging about who'd be the greatest, you know, in heaven. They really thought they were hot stuff, but they weren't. Their faith wasn't so hot, evidently. Their faith was in their semen abilities. They, they, were, they were men of the ocean and men of the water here. 
And, and their faith was in the size of the boat and the size of the anchor. But, but storms teach us something about our faith, period. Do we really have faith? I mean, anybody can be on the top side when things are going well. But how is our faith in the midst of storms? When circumstances are calm, it doesn't require any faith. And so God will stir things up. You know, in the 35-year history of this church, the Fargo Baptist Church, we'll be celebrating it soon here, it's never been calm. And our faith has never been in our finances. In fact, we've always stepped beyond our finances. Our faith has never been in our manpower. We've always stepped beyond our manpower. And we've watched God miraculously bring in that manpower, be it to run a radio station or a Bible college or whatever it might be. We've stepped out by faith. Well, here's the apostles, and they learned something about their faith. But they also learned something about their future. And that is, God wasn't done with them yet. God wasn't done with them yet. And until God is done with us, we're not done. We're not done. Now, storms teach us some really wonderful things. They teach us something about real gratitude. Because <clears throat> really, when things are going great, we take it for granted. When the bank account is full and the children are healthy and so on, it's always sunny. We just take that for granted. But when things get stirred up, I'm telling you, it, it, it does something for us. And we become grateful for the calm. I've gone through some storms. And afterwards, you just go, wow, I'm, I'm grateful for the calm. I, I went out the other night. My daughter had to get home from work at the hospital. And, and I met up with her and led her home in the midst of that whiteout. And I'm telling you, when you get home, you want to kiss the ground of the house and the heat and all that. It's just like, wow. You know, you don't take that for granted anymore. You've come through a storm. Storms teach us real gratitude. Secondly, well, before we move on, i got to show you a verse. Paul said this, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to, be, or how to abound. In other words, good times, bad times. You say, well, how did Paul learn that? By going through some storms. And it's a learned thing. It really is. He, he's right. I have learned in whatsoever state I am. To, to, to basically rest in the Lord. Now, something else storms teach us, and that is to, to rejoice. In Philippians 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord, and again, I say rejoice. I skipped a word on purpose, the word always. Not sometimes, not most of the time, but rejoice always. Storms teach us something about real joy, when we can rest in the Lord no matter what has happened. Storms also teach us something about resting in peace. They, they teach us real peace. You know, we think that peace is when the kids are in bed and the house is clean and it's quiet and everything's just, just died down. That's, that's peace. No, that's calm. That, that's calm. Peace isn't the absence of difficulty. It's the presence of God in the midst of difficulty. And there's a difference. And so storms teach us about peace. And Paul mentioned the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Fourthly, storms teach us what real treasure is all about. You know, Paul lost everything, but it didn't matter. He found Christ. And he said this in Philippians 3 and in verse 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, say doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Storms teach us where the real treasure is. It's not in stuff, it's in the Lord. Now, storms also teach us where real strength is, and it's not in us, it's in God. You know, we can handle the mild annoyances. <laughs> I got this, I can handle, you know, and we can those minor problems that surface on easy days. But I'm telling you, those real trials bring us to the end of ourselves. And we have to completely depend on God. And that's a good place to be. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And Paul said this. And well, God said this to Paul. He said unto me, he said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Let me just say, finally, Storms help us to focus on our real home. <laughs> you know, this, this world is not our home, folks. If you're saved, this world is not your home. And trials in life remind us that this world is not our home. They remind us this world is temporary. And they, they turn our focus from us building our own kingdom, as it were, to, to working toward God's kingdom. 
and, and God's agenda. And so storms can be brutal. They can, they can be difficult. But we read this in 2 Corinthians 4. Paul says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Storms come and go, folks, but eternity is forever. Storms come and go, but Jesus is forever. Christ remains. In fact, your life has a captain, and he's always on board. In fact, he's called the captain of our salvation in Hebrews 2 and in verse number 10. And as long as the captain of our salvation is on board, this, this divine captain, we don't have to worry. There was this boat crossing the Atlantic years ago, and I mentioned this before, it was in the midst of this raging storm and the passengers were all panicking, all except one little boy. He was just calm as a cucumber. He was just giggling and smiling and enjoying the waves and the wind. And, and, and finally, one woman said, son, aren't you scared? He said, nah, well, why not? He said, my dad is the captain of this ship. And he said, my dad's never lost a ship in whatever storm it might be. We have a captain, folks, who has never lost a ship. And he's always on board. If we're saved, he resides within us. Now, this captain always has a course in mind. He's always heading somewhere. Notice in verse 22, it says, Now it came to pass on a certain day that he, Jesus, went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. He knew exactly what he was up to. He knew exactly about that demoniac on the other side. Christ always has a course. We don't. Sadly, there are many lives that are out there just bobbing around without any course. But when you get saved, you have a captain, you have a course, and thirdly, you also have a completion. Because whatever Christ starts, he finishes. He's on board and he'll complete the mission. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. What took place in Decapolis, he was there to, to get her done. The Bible says this, speaks of this hope that we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Now, let me just say this about storms. They can be sudden, and uh, they can be unexpected. It can be a phone call that changes everything. All of a sudden, your, your world is, is turned upside down. We never know when they're coming and to what extent they're coming. In fact, the Bible says, boast not of thy, thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Who would have known a week ago that these people would be in eternity? That I spoke of a moment ago. Moment ago. Now again, sometimes people need a, a storm to get their attention, to wake them out of their apathy, and, and God will do that. In fact, we read in Psalm 83, so persecute them with thy tempest and make them afraid with thy storm. There are times when a lost person needs that. God has a purpose for that. You know that there was a survey taken and nine out of 10 respondents reported that they were able to find a more positive meaning in life as a result of a, a serious setback. Now, it could be a death or divorce or painful experience, uh, illness, but they actually, it was something that, that was used in their life to uh, put a more meaningful reason for their life. There was a uh, blacksmith who got saved some years ago, back in the 1800s. And he had all kinds of trouble after he got saved. So much so that a friend in the village showed up and kind of chided him over the window of his shop. And he said, you know, you became one of them born-again Christians. And since you did, all this bad stuff is coming down on you. What, what, what's with that? I, I thought you were supposed to have this cushy life when you became a child of God. Blacksmith just smiled. He held up a carriage spring. He said, you know, this carriage spring was at one time a a piece of iron like this over here, and he held it in his other hand. He said, but I took that piece of iron, I melted it down, I hammered it, and I forged it, and I, I did this, and I did that. And he said, it's a valuable carriage spring now. It's worth a lot of money compared to this, this bar of iron over here, which is worth pennies, basically, at the time. And the point is, God has to put us through the mill sometimes with the fire and the hammering and the, the forging and all of that. He's got a purpose for it. You know, we read this in Psalm 88 and in verse number 9. Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. God is in control. You know, I read this last week that even hurricanes help.
help balance out the weather and things like we see here in our areas of late. And you go, well, what's with this? Well, I'm not a meteorologist, so I'll just read it. <clears throat> but it says, without an occasional hurricane, the, the world's weather might be even worse. Fierce tropical storms play a vital part in maintaining the heat balance between the tropics and the polar regions. The tropics and subtropics receive more heat from the sun than they lose by radiation. So to prevent cooling of the poles and the scorching of the equator regions, hurricanes help keep the balance. If hurricanes control, if hurricane control were successful and none were allowed to go through their full life cycle, says Gordon Dunn, the former director of the National Hurricane Center in Miami, nature would undoubtedly find some other method of maintaining that heat balance and who can say that this new method might not be even more disastrous than the hurricanes? And you know, there's a reason even for those. Now I said last week, there's a lot of, a lot of experiences out on water that talk about storms and, and, and people going through things. There's a lot of literature out there that talk about these storms. There's a lot of songs that have been written. And, and we, we talk about Jesus, Savior, pilot me over life's tempestuous sea. We, we sing ship ahoy. I was drifting away on life's pitiless sea. And, and uh, we talk about a lot of things involving this. But God allows all of this for a reason. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you say, well, I'm going through some things, could it be the Lord trying to get your attention? If you are here and you are a child of God, you have been born again, you say, why me? Well, God has a bigger picture than we see. And we never know exactly why, but we do know that God doeth all things well, don't we? I want to close with this poem here. My father's way may twist and turn. My heart may throb and ache. But in my soul, I'm glad I know. He maketh no mistake. My cherished plans may go astray. My hopes may fade away. But still I'll trust my Lord to lead for he doth know the way. Though night be dark, and it may seem the day will never break, I'll pin my faith, my all in him, he maketh no mistake. There's so much now I cannot see, my eyesight's far too dim, but come what may, I'll simply trust and leave it all to him. For by and by the midst will lift, and plain it all he'll make. Though all the way, though dark to me, he made not one mistake.